What if we're meant to live lives full of color, joy, peace, and vitality? What if we're meant to live life in HD? As Andy mentioned, we're wrapping up this uh, series on the book of Philippians, and it's interesting if you look throughout history, really, uh, there are certain ways in which people end correspondence, and, and they're consistent with it. So this, what we call the book of Philippians, is a letter. It's a letter written by Paul to the church at Philippi. But he wrote other letters that are recorded for us in the scriptures, and he ends all of his letters almost all the same way. But I thought it was interesting that the Apostle Paul is not the only one who does that. There are famous people throughout history who uh, ended their, their correspondence, their, their salutations were very unique to who they were. So I just want to share a few of them with you here this morning. Here's the first one by J.R.R. Tolkien, who, of course, wrote the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I trust you will find this reply satisfactory and remain yours faithfully. If you've read the Lord of the Rings, that's actually pretty concise for Tolkien. Here's another one. With the greatest esteem and respect, I am your most obedient and most humble servant. Benjamin Franklin, if you know anything about Benjamin Franklin, he was not a humble person. <laughs> Here's another one. With friendly thanks and best wishes, yours, Albert Einstein. Here's another. Affectionately, your brother, Abraham Lincoln. He, he, he identified with that familial aspect with everyone. He, I, I'm your brother. And he, that was important to him. Ernest Hemingway would end like this. Always your friend. Mark Twain... I do, I do, I do. And of course, not to be outdone, Dr. Seuss. All the best. So how does Paul wrap up his letter? How does he end? He actually ends, we're going to find, with two great challenges. The whole book of Philippians is full of challenges. It's probably one of the most practical letters that Paul writes. Because it's really a challenge how to live the Christian life. It's not heavy on doctrine and theology. He's not trying to bring a bunch of correction. He's really saying, how do you apply this thing called Christianity to your life? And so it's full of challenges, and he ends with two huge challenges. And we're going to find in the midst of those two challenges, there is a verse that is perhaps one of the top five most well-known verses in all the Bible. So here it goes. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Basically, what he's saying here is you have finally been able to send me a financial gift. You've wanted to do it, but you haven't been able to. And we read earlier there was a man named Epaphroditus. We're going to come back to him later on. But... Earlier in this letter, he mentions him. Epaphroditus brought this gift with him. So Paul is basically saying, I rejoice that at last your concern for me has had an opportunity to be fulfilled. Remember, Paul is in prison. He's chained in prison in Rome. And that meant his ability to earn any kind of income was gone. He couldn't work. Therefore, he needed financial support. And he's saying, now you Philippians have finally done that. So he's thanking them for that. Then he goes on and says this. I am not saying this because I am in need, but he was in need. Okay? He's not saying this. So he's saying, I'm, I'm thanking you that you did this. Not because I'm in need, but I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. So he goes, yes, I'm in need, but it's not about my need because I have learned to be content. This is the first great challenge that he touches on, contentedness. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. Listen, who likes to know a good secret? You know, the secret sauce, the secret recipe, you know, the, 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 the secret. You want to know what it is. Paul is saying, I've learned a secret. I'm going to tell you what that is in just a moment. Learn the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So Paul is setting the stage. He's saying, you've, you've supported me financially. I appreciate that so much. I rejoice in that. I am so thankful. 
He says, but my need isn't what, what motivates me because I've learned this secret, this secret of contentedness. And I want to share with you what that secret is. And in revealing what that secret is, he pens what is probably one of the uh, most, uh, what, what I would call viral verses in the scriptures. By a viral verse, I mean verses that they've been tracking this now for about the last 10 years, 15 years. Verses that are the most uh, posted on social media, hashtag, tweeted, put on Instagram, bookmarked, liked, shared. This verse that I'm about to read is almost every year in the top five. Sometimes it's the number one. But it's almost always in the top five. It is one of the most viral verses in the scripture. And Paul's saying, I'm going to let you know what the secret is. Do you want to know what the secret is? Here it is. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can understand why that is a viral verse. It's so popular that it was actually a few years back on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It was on Tim Tebow's eye patch. He had it there, Philippians. 413. It, it is well known, and I can understand why it's a viral verse. If you're looking for a verse that you can pluck out and apply to any situation in life, this is it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you want a verse that's going to pump you up when you're struggling, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you want a verse that you want to superimpose upon your, your kids when they're complaining about a chore you've given them, remember, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You want a verse for your spouse when they're struggling at their, at their job or in something they're trying to do, remember, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You want to demand more of your employees and you're a Christian uh, business owner, put that on the wall. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do the job of 10 people. I'm only going to pay you less than minimum wage. You can do all things. It, it, is, it is understandably why it's a viral verse. It has actually become almost a mantra for some people. When they're struggling, when they're having a hard time, when they're, when they're not sure if they can get through a situation, they just say this over, I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When my kids were growing up, we had this uh, album by Steve Green, and it was basically Bible verses to song. And this was one of them. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My wife made them sing that nonstop. <laughs> it's one of those that you convince yourself. I can do all, I can get the job. I can close the deal. I can pass the test. I can make the team. I can do the deal. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The impossible is no longer impossible. Nothing is insurmountable. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Isn't that inspiring? Except it's misapplying the word of God. <laughs> That's not what this verse means. The ver this verse isn't about being able to do everything. This verse isn't about having the strength to get by in everything. That verse is actually the secret of learning to find contentedness. Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content and having much and having little. And here's the secret. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So let me read from a different translation of the Bible. And I believe it illuminates this a little bit better. From the voice, it says it like this. I can be content in any and every situation through the anointed one, Christ, the Messiah. Through the anointed one who is my power and my strength. Well, that, that's not going to be on my eye patch. That, that's not going to inspire me to get the job and close the deal and make the team and pass the test. I can be content in any and every situation. That's going to tell me when things are bad, no matter what my circumstance, no matter my situation, I don't need to change it. I can, by the grace and the power of Christ, I can endure it. In other words, I can learn to be content in Christ because I will be strengthened through Christ to get through every situation in life. Or you could put it like this. This verse is not about being able to do all things. It's about being able to be content in all situations. It changes how that whole verse sounds 
when you put it in context and realize Paul's talking about learning to live a contented life. Learning to say, if I have plenty, if I have little, if I'm well-fed or if I'm hungry, I can be content. What it does, it removes from us a mindset of discontentedness. See, discontentedness is, is kind of like, oh, if I had this, if I had that, and it moves us from that. In other words, you do not need to live an if-only life. You can live as an, an as-only life. And if only life says, if only I had the job, if only I could go there, if only I could buy this house, if only I could be with this person, if only I had this, if only I had that, then I'd be fulfilled. Then I'd be content. Then my life would have meaning. But an as only life says, I can live as only someone who's in a relationship with Christ. I can live as only someone who has learned to find contentedness through the strength and the empowering work of God in my life. I can live as only someone who says, no matter what's going on around me, I can be content. And it's not an easy thing because contentedness is something that we, we often misapply. We think contentedness will lead to um, a life that doesn't produce anything. And so we, we say, I don't want to be content because it's, it's not going to help me achieve all my goals. And so we make it about all these externals. If only I had this, if only I only have that, then it will produce contentedness. But Paul says it's the exact opposite. Contentedness allows you to live as only Christ wants you to live. It's all about your relationship with Christ because your relationship with Christ transcends every situation you face Everything you're going through, it helps you walk through all those things. His strength will give you contentedness. See, being content is not based on what is going on in your life, but who is in your life. If you make contentedness about externals, then it's about do I have relational harmony? Did I, do I have a, a career success? Am I fulfilled in life? It's all externals. If you make contentedness about your relationship with Christ, then it's about how do I invest in God's kingdom? How do I sacrifice for others? How do I learn to live a life that does justly, walks humbly with my God, as it teaches us in Micah? How how do I learn to do those things? It's, It's internal. It's about my relationship with God. Contentedness is based on who is in your life, not what's going on in your life. So what happens is we, we take contentedness and we misalign it. So there's another verse. At another point, Paul is writing to his spiritual son, Timothy. And we mentioned Timothy earlier in this series. He was a, a protege. Paul was his mentor. And he's writing a letter to him. And this is what he says. Godliness with contentment is great gain. See, we often think that contentedness will not produce the life that we want. But Paul is saying contentedness will actually give you great gain in life. So what he's saying is this. This is what godly contentment looks like. You're content. Contentedness produces joy. Joy gives you motivation for the things of God. Motivation for the things of God helps you to step out in faith. As you step out in faith, you live an abundant life and you store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Great gain. Treasures in heaven where moth cannot uh, destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. What, what greater gain is there? Anything you gain on earth will all be burned up, be gone. Great gain, treasure in heaven. That is what godly contentedness produces. Joy, motivation for God, stepping out in faith, abundant life, treasure in heaven. We learn to invest for God's kingdom, sacrifice for others, live a life that's pleasing to God, no matter what the circumstances and situations we face. The the opposite, what a worldly view of contentment is, is often this. Contentedness leads us to become complacent. I'm content, I'm complacent. I won't work any harder, I won't try and do anything, and so thou, therefore I have a lack of drive, I have no motivation. So instead of stepping out in faith, I just take the easy way. I take the easy path, I go the easy way. I don't live an abundant life, I'll live a diminished life. I mean, I'm content, I'm just sitting back. Who am I touching? Who am I changing? Who am I impacting? And therefore I end up left 
with nothing. But that's the complete misunderstanding of what godly contentedness is. I, I hear people say all the time, I, I don't want to be complacent. Therefore, I can't be content. And they miss the whole point. Actually, if you learn godly contentment, godliness with contentment is great gain. So we have to learn to, to see it from God's perspective. Godliness with contentment is great Again, I have learned, Paul said, the secret of being content in any and every circumstance, whether well-fed or hungry, because I can be content through Christ who strengthens me. So that's the first great challenge that Paul puts out there. How can you learn to be content? For most of us, that's what we wrestle with. We're not content. If if we're single, we want to be married. If we're married, we want kids. If we have kids, we want a house. If we have a house, we want a bigger house. If we have a house, we want a car. If we have a car, we want two cars. If we have a job, we want a better paying job. If we have a better paying job, we want a bigger title. And we're never content. I'm not saying we shouldn't want better things. I'm saying we have to get to the point where we say, no matter what I have, I can be content. If God never promotes me, if God never moves me, if God never opens the door, I don't need to force it open. I can simply rest in God. If God doesn't heal me, I can be content. If God doesn't do a miracle, I can be content. If I don't have food to eat, Paul says, I can be content. And if I'm sitting at a banquet, I don't have to eat so much that I gorge myself. I can be content. That's how we need to learn to live. And then he goes on and says this. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. So he's not saying I was troubled and you you got in trouble too. I'm in jail. It's good for you to be in jail too. That's not what he's saying. He's saying was in my trouble you shared with me. You gave to me. In my moment of need, it was good for you to share with me. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of our acquaintance, now Paul had traveled to Philippi. He he, he made the first Christian converts there. They never heard of Christianity. No one had. So he shows up. He preaches Christ and Christ crucified and resurrected. They put their faith in Jesus and he starts churches in, in, in that city in Philippi. Early in our acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. So it's interesting. Paul is saying, no one gave except you. Remember, Paul's in prison. He's in a Roman prison. He's chained in prison, which means he is chained 24 hours a day to a guard. And if there wasn't a guard available, he's chained to the wall. He's chained in prison. Now, Roman prisons were interesting things. They didn't provide clothing, any kind of blankets, anything to sleep on. They didn't provide food. They didn't provide candles for light. They didn't provide any kind of parchment to write upon. They didn't provide a cloak to stay warm. They provided nothing. You went into prison with what you had, and as long as you were in prison, that's all you had, unless someone sent it to you. Either you could buy it or it was sent to you. So Paul is saying, here I am, and I'm in prison, and I had nothing. Because no one stepped up. Not one person stepped in to help me except for you, Philippians. You're the only ones. Even before I was in prison, when I was in a different city, Thessalonica, and I was starting churches there, and I was preaching the gospel there, you're the only ones who supported my ministry and my missionary work. You're the only ones. They didn't even care. Nobody cared except you. And so one of the things that that teaches me, that opens my eyes to, is that, is this, that provision for the local church is personal. It's personal. Paul is saying, you all took this as a personal responsibility. You stepped up to the plate. You did this. There are people who teach ideas like, if God wants a church to have money, he'll give them church money. That somehow, supernaturally, miraculously, money will just appear. It will float down from the sky. 
And therefore, if a church doesn't have money, well, God must not want them to have money. As a matter of fact, Hudson Taylor, who's a great missionary to China, is quoted as saying this, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Now, I agree with his heart behind that. The problem is it can be twisted and misapplied and become horrible. Horrible doctrinally, horrible theologically. Because people will twist it and say, well, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Therefore, if a church is lacking God's supply, they must not be doing God's work or not doing it God's way. And what it does is, we said, provision for the local church is personal. It removes personal responsibility. It's all on God. It's all God's responsibility to provide to do this. But let's think now. We just read about Paul. And he's in prison, and he has nothing. Paul, who was arguably the greatest apostle who ever lived, his teachings and writings and leadership were foundational to the early church. Indeed, he wrote more books in the New Testament than any other person. He's one of the greatest missionaries ever. The churches he started were the springboard from which Christianity infiltrated the world. He may not have reached the largest number of people, but he certainly impacted more of human history than just about anyone save Jesus Christ. So, Paul is in prison, lacking God's supply. Was Paul doing God's work? Was Paul doing it God's way? Why was he lacking God's supply? Because people didn't take the need personally. No church except the Philippians stepped up to help stepped up to fill the gap. Now, I'm saying all this. So, let me give you an example. I love this church. We have have a committed core of people here that are so generous, it blows my mind. We just just had a leadership meeting this last week, and and Edwin shared the financial reports, and I said, well, praise God. So, we, we are not in need. You all are generous, and I appreciate that. I am constantly in awe, and I thank God for the generosity of this church. But if, if I were to stand up here and say, hey, folks, I, I just need you to know we're, we're, we're in a tight place financially, and, and we need you to step up. If I were to say that, there would be someone listening who would say, well, they must not be doing God's work, or they're not doing it God's way. Something's not right. Something's not right here. I don't know what it is, but something's not right. And what they do is they disconnect the fact that they don't give anything. They disconnect the fact that they aren't giving, they aren't taking personal responsibility. They are somehow saying, this is, this is an issue in the church. This isn't my issue. But we have to remember, financial support for the local church does not usually come supernaturally. It comes through the generosity of people. It comes through the generosity of people. Again, I love our church. We have people that are generous, and the generosity of people is lived out and seen through tithing. You know, tithes, I've taught on this. It's 10% of your income. 10% of what you bring in goes back to the local church before anything. That's what biblical tithing is. So through tithes, through offerings, those who give over and above that 10%. And then through regular systematic giving, people who say regularly and consistently, as Paul writes somewhere else, set aside a percentage of your income and give it. I do it regularly, consistently. It's not, oh, I can afford to do it this month, so I'll do it. I can't afford it next month, and and it's inconvenient, and the the check bounced, and the the credit card didn't go through, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it next month. No, regular, systematic, doing it every week, every month, whatever the frequency is, regularly, systematically, and if you miss, you make up for it. Regular, systematic giving. Because of that, that's how God almost always provides for the local church, through the generosity of people. See, there are great churches. I know pastors of great churches all across this country, and a lot of them are struggling financially. And they're not struggling financially. Not us. Please hear me. It's not Hickory Ridge. But there are churches that are struggling financially. And it's not because there's some mismanagement of funds. It's not because something wrong is happening. It's because people won't move in obedience to what God has asked. So, the first thing we see in, that, in what Paul writes is that provision for the local church, for min- the ministry of the church, is personal in nature. The next thing is this, and this might blow your mind. Churches that need the most 
are often those who are doing the most. Now, I didn't say churches that are the neediest. There's a lot of needy churches. They may not be doing anything. They're just needy. I'm talking about the churches that need the most. I hear people say sometimes things like this. Why would a church need that much? Why, why would any church need that much money? It's typically because they're doing that much good work. They're doing the most to reach out and, and, and uh, capture those who are far from Christ. They're meeting the needs of the poor and the, and the downcast in their community. And at the same time, they're endeavoring to meet the needs of those within the local church. And so they're investing huge resources into those things. Those that are doing the most need the most. Think about it. The reason that sometimes there's a, 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 there seems to be a, a struggle with receiving what they need is because isn't that where the enemy is going to attack? Okay, where, where is Satan going to attack? Is he going to attack a church that's sitting back, not doing a whole lot, not caring a whole lot, not reaching out to the community, not helping people, not advancing the kingdom and the cause of Christ? Or is he going to attack the place where his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, is being most threatened? And so he attacks financially, which is one of the reasons why Paul talks about finances so often. Churches that need the most are often those who are doing the most. And then Paul goes on and says this. Not that I'm looking for a gift. You've already sent a gift. I'm not asking for another one. Not that I'm looking for a gift. I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. I love that. He's saying, wow, you all are so generous. Thank you. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So what's something that we see here? One thing we see is that Paul appreciates what they sent. Remember, he's in prison, he doesn't have anything, and the offering comes in and it says, I rejoice. I rejoice that at the last you've renewed your concern for me. I, I, he rejoices, he, the gift comes in, and he says, thank you, thank, I am amply supplied. So one of the things that we learn is this, contentment produces gratitude, but the opposite is also true, discontentment produces <clears throat> ingratitude. Paul's content, if I'm hungry or if I'm well-fed, I'm content. So whatever you sent, I rejoice in. I am grateful for. I will not bemoan how much you gave. Thank you, thank you, thank you, a thousand times thank you. But if you are discontented, no matter what someone gives, it's never enough. It's never, have you ever met someone like that? They get something, some kind of financial support, some kind of uh, remuneration, whatever it is. And what do they do? Well, I thought it was going to be more than that. That's, that's not enough. I, Years and years ago, I used to teach uh, kids' church. I still do it from time and again just to, you know, because it's fun. I love working with kids. But um, I would give out candy to the kids. And they, if they show up, you get a piece of candy, two pieces. If you answer a question, you get three, whatever it is. And almost every week, there would be some darling child. All said and done, and they'd get one piece of candy. And then they would come up to me and go, I only got one piece. I only got one. Discontentedness produces ingratitude. So I would say to them, trying to love them, encourage them in the things of God, be quiet. No. Um, <laughs> I'd say, well, let me ask you a question. I'd say, okay. How much candy did you have when you got here? Well, I didn't have any. I said, well, you've got more than you started with. Yeah, but they got eight pieces. I said, it's not about what they got. How much did you have when you came in? None. You have more than when you started. And even if you had none, and I take it away from them, I would do this. That's why I don't teach kids anymore. <laughs> I said, no, even if you had none, you're not worse than when you started. Learn to be content with what you have. And I'd give it back to them. I don't know if those lessons ever got through, but it made me feel better. But contentment produces gratitude. Paul says, I'm amply supplied. Discontentment produces ingratitude. Never enough. It's never the right thing. It's never the right way. And you're just constantly looking for more. Because it's all based on externals instead of the internal reality of Christ giving you the strength to walk in contentment. 
So that's the first thing that we see when he, when he talks about this. Then, then he says, uh, he said, I, I say all this, not that I'm looking for a gift. I'm looking to what it credits on your account. So that's an interesting thing. Basically what Paul is saying is when you give, when you give, when you gave, God was looking. God noticed. And something happened beyond the natural. Something happened in the supernatural. See, when you give to God's work, it is marked in heaven. There are, there are not a lot of investments that you can make that have an eternal benefit. There are ones that you can make. Listen, there are ones you can make that have long-term investments. It's why sometimes giving to the local church is hard for people. Because we don't see a payoff. It's kind of like investing in your retirement, in your 401k or your uh, IRA. You're, you're putting money in, hopefully in your 20s and 30s, but you don't need it until your 60s or 70s. And so you've got a, a 40 or 50 year window where you don't see the payoff, except compounded interest, and hopefully you see it getting bigger and bigger, but it's just kind of like, oh, maybe one day I'll, and you don't see the value in it. Even more so when it comes to things that are marked in heaven. When God marks it in heaven, he's saying, when you step from the temporal world into the eternal world, you will receive something for your generosity to my work. But you might have, you're going to have to wait your whole life. Whatever, however many years that is. So some of you, you're closer than others, but you still have to wait. And then one day, God says, now, this has been credited to your account. Because of what you did. Because of what you did that helped advance my kingdom and my cause here on earth. If you give a cup of water to a little one in my name. If you give a cup of water to a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you give the impact of that, giving to the local church. Anything that happens through that gift, you actually get credit for. That's incredible. That's better than compounded interest. In other words, you give to the church and someone gets saved, you get credit for that person re being reached for Christ. You, you give to the church and a marriage is, is, is held together and doesn't fall apart, God says you get credit for that. So that's what it means, what's credited to your account. So remember this, God always rewards generosity toward his kingdom, toward his church, toward his cause. He always rewards it. Then Paul goes on and he says this verse, it's right on the end of it. It says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, you have met my needs. And as you have met my needs, God will meet yours. They met Paul's needs and God says, now, I'll meet theirs. It's, it is a sense of recipro uh, reciprocal in nature. In other words, this promise, and I've heard people say it, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, is a conditional promise. You can't just take this one, pluck it out, and, and say, God will meet all my needs. He'll meet all your needs if you give generously, if you give consistently, if you support the work of God's kingdom here on earth. Then his promise, he'll meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So, so there is a sense in which God notices, God sees, God marks, and God rewards those both in eternity and even here on earth. When you, you, when you give generously to his kingdom, your giving will result in your blessing. So Paul is, is, he, he is wrapping up his letter, and it's almost like he said all this stuff, and he says, oh, there's just two big things I want to hit you right between the eyes with. Learning to live a life of contentment and learning to be generous. I wanted to save those to the end, lest you started and read those and didn't read the rest of the letter. So he saves these to the end. And he, and he hits home with them. He says, you need to learn to live contentedness, a contented life through Christ who strengthens you, and you need to learn to be generous to the kingdom cause of God here on earth. And then he has his closing. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. Brothers who are with me, send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. And here's his, his closing, that he ends something like this in almost every one of his letters. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. I'm going to ask if the worship team would come forward.
Paul ends almost all of his letters appealing to grace. I believe partly it's because he's looking at all that he just wrote. And in essence, he's saying this. After everything that I have challenged you with, you need grace. After everything I've written, after everything that we've, we've looked at over these last nine weeks, you need grace. How to continue in the cooperating work of the Holy Spirit in your life. How to be free from legalism. How to embrace upside down living. You need grace. How to live a life marked by gentleness. You need grace. How to resolve conflict. You need grace. How to find a spiritual mentor. You need grace. How to choose joy. How to be content. You need grace. You need grace in every aspect of your life. You need grace to be free from worry. You need grace in order to change and shift your attitudes and the things you think upon. You need grace. You need grace to live a life of generosity. After everything I've challenged you with, Paul says, you need grace. Now, if you've been with us for all of this series or parts of it, I think we all would say, I need grace. I need grace to do these things. I need grace to live these things out. I need grace to strengthen me. I need grace to form me. I need grace to convict me. I need grace if I'm going to live the way that Paul challenges me to live here in the book of Philippians. So I'm going to ask if you'd stand with me. Life is hard. Every day, anxieties, sin, worries, and fears cloud our vision. They consume us. They rob us of our ability to see clearly, our ability to live. But what if we don't have to live this way? What if we were meant to experience life differently? What if we're meant to live lives full of color, joy, peace, and vitality? What if we're meant to live life in HD?